I learned something when I went to Homelite, which is if the money is private, if you're not taking any federal money to make the loans, you can do whatever you want. So you could become the lender that has the 5% interest rates and just boom, there you go. You just opened yourself up, man. And it's not like, oh my gosh, these are unqualified people. They're the same people that five minutes ago were paying 2%, 3%, 4% and are now getting ready to pay 7%. So I think there's a really healthy, good still pool of buyers that would be very happy with a privately funded 5% option. That's what that says to me. Under all is the land, the real, real of real estate. Courtney, your friends about to show you how to generate wealth. Get educated, do for yourself. Add a couple notches to your belt. Under all is the land, under all is the land. Welcome to season two, episode three of Under All Is The Land. I'm Courtney Polis, your hostess with the mostest, here with my rock star co-stars. So, Renan, I Hi. forgot your name. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I was so like trapped in my hostess <laughs> moment. I thought you were, I thought you were I like know. saying like, see your name. I'm like, is she going to get it? I, I know. know what's that happening. was weird. Okay, let me try that again. No, this is cute. Oh, Anyways. it is? Okay, okay fine. And, and... Dominique Madden. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> Clearly, we've had too much coffee today. Um, so, what are y'all ladies uh, thinking about and talking about this morning? Well, um, Trevor Noah is leaving the Today Show. The Today Show? No, is he on the Today Show? No. No. What is it called again? The D- the Daily Show. The freaking Daily, daily, show. Yes. daily show. The, the daily, daily Show. Trevor Noah. It was Noah John Stewart. Is, yes, yes, it was. Yes. And Trevor took over, and I he guess did. he's leaving now. Yeah. How do you After feel about that? After eight years, seven years? Do we care? Yeah, I like him. I think he did a very good job. I think he did a good job too. Yeah. John Stewart's tough I mean, shoes to fill. Very, really. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people I love wish, him so I much. wish he would come back. You do? I do. Maybe he will. I think he had another I, show. I think he should be running for president. He would, buy, he would be my candidate. <laughs> really? Wow. Yes. Why? Because he made an animal farm? Did he? He made an animal farm. Yeah, he like No, because animals. I think he has, he has, mm-hmm. he has all the right thoughts. He's a, he's a great guy. He's how do you feel I about Bill like Maher? Love Bill Maher. Okay. Does he have I all the right love thoughts? Bill Maher. He does not. Okay. He's very polarizing, Bill Maher. So no but he's funny. Mess. I like his, I like his <laughs> cynical side. Mm-hmm. I really do. Do you like Bill Maher? You know, it's a great question. I one time had a very naughty dream about Bill Maher, which Ooh. has left me feeling a certain type of way. Like, I'm wow. like, I can't believe. The worst <laughs> part is he was in his boxers and, <laughs> and, and, and socks. Okay. And I was like, had the hots for him in this dream. What okay. was his body saying? Uh, I don't, it didn't go that far. It was just like, I remember having like a crush on Bill Maher in my dream, which mm-hmm. is so weird. So I feel a little ashamed sometimes when I say the words Bill Maher. Like, in, but to be honest, you know, I've watched the show lately and I, I am impressed by people <clears throat> who, you know, are allowing themselves to have thoughts outside the polarizing boxes of mm-hmm. left wing and right mm-hmm. wing. You know, and I always appreciate people who, uh, who have conversation and ask tough questions and realize the hypocrisy that happens on both sides. And mm-hmm. so Bill's gotten better at that. He did. I yeah. have to say, like mm-hmm. when I watch, sometimes I agree, sometimes I don't agree, but by and large, I'm like, you're asking questions that should be asked, even of the party that you are aligned with, you yep. know, which I think is critical. There was a time when he went so left so extremely left that I was like, I'm losing him. Yeah, I can't. Exactly. I can't do it. Don't me too. don't do it. But Same. now he's back. I think now he's, he's back. back in a, his cynical dark himself. Like I like <laughs> it. I love it. I love it. All right. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, speaking of cynical and dark, there have been a lot of news, real estate news stories that have come out in the past couple of days that are probably worth noting. You've pulled a couple yeah, out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. There have been some really interesting ones. One is regarding Google search data. And uh, apparently real estate market crash has skyrocketed as mortgage rates have increased. Mm. What crash? <laughs> I mean. Crash where? Yeah. <laughs> where? Yeah, like, it's true. What? It's like you have to remember. I mean, that, what that says to me is that this messaging is getting through to consumers, but they don't know what to do with it. And also... Crash 
The crash that happened before was caused by circumstances that are very different than what's going on right now. This is typical. This is normal. This is cyclical. This is what the Fed does every couple of years. You know, Biden's been talking about reducing inflation since he's gotten to office. Nothing's coming as a surprise. It's all very, you know, very like laid out, anticipated, predictable. Come on. Yeah, honestly. I mean, who's making these headlines it like we said before it's like somebody's winning yeah when people but the but it doesn't match the reality of what's going on in the market because buyers need to remember a seller needs to want to sell to you too so you can write all the lowball crazy ass offers you want but a seller doesn't have to agree to mm-hmm. your price so it could mm-hmm. be a Tremendous waste of time if you're not willing to at least get a little bit more rational with your offer writing too. Mm-hmm. It's you so know? true. There's that, no crash right now. There's no us. crash. I, I find it interesting that that word even shows up there. Like why? 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 Because when, no when the headlines say, oh, interest rates are going up, inventory is falling and prices are getting cut and da, da, da. Then people start to wonder, is there going to be a crash? Right. But mm-hmm. here's the other thing. People always say, oh, I'm going to time the market. I'm going to time the market. It's like, no, you're not. You know as well as I do that investors and high risk tolerance people are the only people that actually buy when the market's down. Regular buyers do not buy when the market's down. They follow the news headlines and they stay out of the market. They get scared. They're like, ooh, you know, they they get like, if nobody else is buying, I don't want to be the fool that's buying right now. Mm -hmm. I literally have this conversation every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With buyers. I so just people, had this yeah. conversation. Yeah. Just had this conversation with someone who's just entering the buying market right now when so many people are running away from it. And, you know, her dad's been telling her actually for the past two years, buy something, buy something. Finally, she's taking the advice, but her friends who are all renters of are like, don't buy. Interest rates are crazy. They're at 7%. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. what are you going to do? You know, the housing prices are going to fall even more so. You shouldn't be buying right now. And I'm like, wait, hold on. Okay. First of all, don't listen to friends who are renting mm-hmm. about what you should be Preach. buying. You know? <laughs> um, two, you know, just uh, uh, like ask those friends or even just look at your own rental, you know, History. like ex- ex- yeah, expenses, right? You've been renting for six years. You know, if you've been renting at $2,000 a month for six years, you know, that's that's like, a chunk of change. That's a nice chunk of change. That's a down payment. Yeah. You know, but it's all a loss. You don't get anything off of that. Right. Whereas if you had invested that money six years ago into or some money, you know, mm-hmm. into a purchase, now you'd be sitting on appreciation despite the market correcting right now. You would have some equity to work with that you could feel, you know, that you could feel safe by that if you did, if there was like, you know, Lord forbid some kind of crazy, you know recession or whatever you know you would have equity to then pull from to help you with things you need to do Mm -hmm. you know you could cash out refi you could heloc but when you're renting you have none None of that that. power Mm -hmm. yep you know so don't take the advice not to buy (laughs) buy and have some power because either way you're paying something every month to someone it's just whose mortgage are you paying yes yeah that's it yeah yeah um even now buy now even if the rates are high it doesn't matter they come back down yeah, like they come back down. The investors are the ones that are timing the market. They yes, know what to do. They yeah. know so, what to do. So follow that. Follow the investors. <laughs> exactly. Buy now. Don't buy. Do not not buy now well, because people scare you. Look at the last crash. The last crash. Mm-hmm. The prices were so low. We were selling houses in Highland Park for $300,000. Like, that was the acquisition price. Mm-hmm. 300000 and then adding like $100,000 in value and selling for like five fifty, feeling like, whoa, we are killing it. Mm-hmm. It's not me personally, but like my renovation resale people. Mm-hmm. And nobody was buying. We had no competition. Nobody was competing. Now, mm-hmm. if everybody would have bought at that time and held on to it until last year, they would have been millionaires. Mm-hmm. Freaking millionaires. And now they're complaining, oh, prices are so high. It's like most regular people are risk averse. But if you really want to make smart real estate decisions, you have to take risk because it's calculated and predictable what the outcome is going to be. I always say real estate's a soft science, but there's one thing you can count on in Los Angeles. Over time, the prices will go up. That is just what it is. It's not yeah. a short-term game. It's not a short-term game. Buy always. and hold. Sometimes it is a short-term game. Yes. Right now, it's not going to be a short-term game mm-hmm. for a while. Okay, mm-hmm. so you can rent it out. You can do whatever, leverage it. 
you know, refinance and, and your rates. Yeah, exactly. That's the yeah. thing too, you know, is then I think people are looking at the short term, you know, it's like, okay, if I'm buying now and then I have to sell next year, you know, am, am I going to take a loss? Problem? Am I going to take a loss? Um, well, guess what? Don't sell. Right. <laughs> Rental exactly. prices have gone up traditionally in LA. I mean, you know, there are moments whenever they've come down a little bit, like in the pin, in the beginning of the pandemic, when people mm-hmm. were more conscious about where they were renting and what they were renting for a second. Right. There was a moment where you had a little more negotiation power in your leases, right? But not anymore. That time has come and gone. So if you're going to be buying something, you know, it's it's not about it, it's it's not about when you buy it. It's about when you choose to sell it. Right. Which is yes. something that you've said. Yeah. And rents are high years, right now. And, and rents are really high right now because so many people are not buying. And guess what? Now it's supply and demand again. Yeah, so I saw this Inman story this morning that Mm. said, actually, there's a flood of Airbnb properties on the market, more Airbnb properties than there are people wanting to rent them. And I thought, hmm, that's that's interesting. So to me, uh, that says to me that our tenants' rights um, laws are probably discouraging what would ordinarily be inventory for long-term leases um, to be short-term leases because people don't want to deal with like what I dealt with, which is a tenant that didn't pay me for a year while I was paying his utilities and his rent and he's driving a Range Rover. But I know I've said that before, but it does piss me off. (laughs) It's crazy. Because it did come out of my actual pocket and it's money I know I will never see back and it's not fair. Mm -hmm. And even though I have a contract, the cost of actually trying to get him to pay is going to be more than the money I would actually get. Mm -hmm. And supposedly there was landlord relief, but we know that was a failure also. Mm -hmm. So for me, I feel like it it discourages people like me who had to suffer during the pandemic with people who didn't pay their rent um, and could have. Okay. I'm not talking about somebody who had an actual hardship. Um, It feels like it it discourages me from wanting to put my house on the market for a long term, especially now we have AB 1482, which has been in place for a couple of years, but people aren't paying attention. But anyway, it's like mandatory um, statewide rent control. And that's something that makes even the properties that were single family homes that used to not be on rent control now be subjected to rent control. So even though inflation might go to a certain place, I'm not allowed to, to, to take advantage of that on my rental side. Yeah. So I'm still left holding the bag. Yeah. I don't like that. I remember when, you know, when people felt more inclined for long-term leases versus short-term leases, because you know, it was less work. It's yeah. like you get someone in, if they're there for a, a good while, that's great because then I don't have to go through the process of marketing and all of that stuff, trying to get a new, you know, renter and missing out on the rent while you're trying to get a new renter. Right. But these days, because just, you know, just because of what you said is like, or sorry, these days, because of what you said, you know, people are going the other direction because just like you were mentioning, they don't want to be bound by these like, you know, crazy laws, aggressive laws, yes. crazy moratoriums mm-hmm. and things that are really discouraging ownership in general. Yeah. Yeah. Well, definitely multifamily ownership multifamily in general. Ownership, yeah. General, that's become a little bit of a softer space in the market right now. I think until the city of Los Angeles removes the emergency ordinance, um, that's going to continue to be so. So I guess I would say if you're a high risk tolerance buyer who wants to buy multifamily, now's your moment. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now is your moment. What else you got? Okay. All right. Well, another interesting headline is that real estate debt is becoming an attractive investment as stocks fall and mortgage rates climb. Hmm. Fascinating. Was it ever not an attractive investment? I mean, recently? I mean, it depends who you ask. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If you ask someone's financial advisor, (laughs) they will tell you to put it in stocks. (laughs) Yes. I remember whenever yes. the crisis happened, like in 2008, people were like joking around, like my 401k became a 201k. And I know I've talked about 401ks before. I'm not a huge fan of them because it feels like playing with somebody else's money. And also you somehow have the right to like fuck that up and there's no real consequence. So it's like, oh, just give us a long-term play, you know, like long-term you'll make 8% return. I'm like the real mm-hmm. estate market's way better than that for right. a return, like way mm-hmm. better than that. But, you know, what they're talking about is, like, people are starting to turn. Maybe maybe that's going to be a good thing for alternative loan programs and that kind of thing because, obviously, whatever lender can come out with something that has a more attractive interest rate is going to be someplace we're going to be referring our clients to. So we know first 
uh, Republic has the Eagle program in certain neighborhoods. You can still get 3.79% with 20% down or whatever. It has to be up a, to 950 loan yeah, amount or loan 970. Yeah, under a million, mm-hmm. something like that, like the conforming loan mm-hmm. rate. But, um, but, you know, I learned something when I went to Homelite, which is if the money is private, if you're not taking any federal money to make the loans, you can do whatever you want. So you could become the lender that has the 5% interest rates. And just boom, there you go. You just opened yourself up, man. It's not like, oh my gosh, these are unqualified people. They're the same people that five minutes ago were paying 2%, 3%, 4% and are now getting ready to pay 7%. So I think there's a really healthy, good still pool of buyers that would be very happy with a privately funded 5% option. That's what that says to me. Do you have any other thoughts on that? (laughs) No. (laughs) That was good. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Why don't we switch to uh, our main subject no, today? No, we have one more news story. Oh, one more news we story. Do. Real estate agents weigh in on Zillow's oh. Showing Time Plus debut. Mm-hmm. So I was con- confused about this. I didn't realize that, um, I guess I d- wasn't paying attention to the, what Zillow was doing. So Zillow bought Showing Time. Which I didn't realize either. No, didn't we used no. to have Showing Time as part of it our... Still it is. Is. Still oh, it still is. Oh, it still is. It still is. Which is on. Yeah, that seems like a conflict of interest. It, it is does. it that Showing Time, though? Is this the same yeah. thing? Yeah, it's got to be that showing, showing Time. Okay, well, then they have a lot of data. Then they have a lot of power and influence well, in our industry. I don't use Showing Time. I don't, I don't either. either. Off. <laughs> Off, no, 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 off, never. Yeah, Yeah. it's such a dumb system. Okay, I agree. So, what are real estate agents weighing in about? What are they saying, and who are these agents? Well, what they're saying, I mean, there's there are you know obviously two sides to everything, and so you know there are some agents who feel like it's you know this behemoth brokerage that first fancied itself as a tech platform right and then pulled the rug out from everyone's feet saying right. guess what we're, we're, real, we're, con- we're your competitors we're um after we've already given them so, so much, much of money. our money yeah mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> um you know so what some people are saying is it's just like further perpetuating their you know like their ability to like Infiltrate the yeah, market. To, to agenda. infiltrate the market. And to and get data. To get yeah. data and to take more power away from agents. How, right. What they're doing, though, is they're marketing it as putting power back in the hands of agents. Somehow, I don't quite understand how, <laughs> but... I'm not comfortable with that. Mm-mm. No. Frankly, I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> There's a reason, there should be yeah. some rules here. Well, there's Where a reason the why they're buying those things, right? Well, of why, course. Yeah, because I mean, they want the data. They want every buyer who's coming in that shows the house and has to make an appointment there. Yeah. I got your email address yeah, Exactly. Now. I, I just I, think, it's like, just, with no. clear cooperation policy, sh- like, showing the butt of our industry's mixed ability to control um, vendor broker narratives, shall I say? I guess that's my way of saying. Unfortunately, I feel like that law, that rule, right, really, really favored big brokerages and allowed them to get through a loophole that people were even using for marketing, which super disempowered the individual broker and smaller boutique brokerages that actually play by the rules. And then, in addition to that, trying to make agents police each other sucks. It's like it turns our industry against each other. I feel like it's a conflict of interest, and I feel like it was not applied equally. And usually, we're such an industry of democracy. We're such an industry of every single person with a license needs to behave a certain way and needs to do a certain thing. And we all share the vision of home ownership as being super beneficial for the general public, right? Like we share that. So when I see stuff like this, I'm like, how, um, how lopsided <clears throat> is it going to get? Are they going what other features that are included with our MLS are they going to get that we have to click through or that we're required to sign up for, or it's included with our membership and they have access to our shit without us clearly understanding what the consequences can be. Yeah. I, that was I, a long sentence. I mean, who owns Lion Desk? Je ne sais pas. Mm-hmm. Hopefully Is there not some? <laughs> we'll look into that. Let's. Oh, uh, that's a good that's idea. Because that's a free one. Yeah, we should. Yeah. yeah. That's a CRM. I mean, I guess we need to have our guards up. Yeah, yeah, so Lion Desk is a CRM that's included with MLS membership uh, here. Well, it's with CR- CAR membership, not CAR. ML- yeah. MLS mm-hmm. membership. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay, interesting. But, right. Yeah, I, de- I haven't delved too much into the Showing Time Plus app, but I would just, if you're a buyer who's using it, 
and you're asked to sign some document that no one's reviewed with you, which I don't know <laughs> if this is a piece of it, but the fact that it has dot loop, which is assigning platform integrated into it, mm. it concerns me that maybe when they're scheduling showings for you, they might be having you sign a representation agreement. I don't know this, but yep. if ever that is the case, do not sign a representation agreement <laughs> with anyone that you do not know and haven't interviewed to be your agent. Mm. Because if they are showing you and you've signed a representation agreement, they have the right to represent you. Right. You know? mm. And if you don't know who you're being shown by or who the agent is, that's not a great move. Right. Totally. As it is, Without any documents, without any signature, it's mm -hmm. just someone who's opening the door for you. Mm -hmm. But they're likely not the listing agent if right. they're coming through Zillow. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, for sure not the listing agent. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well, that's all very exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm excited today. Yes. Yeah. Why? Because you're going to interview me. Yes. Yeah, I love being interviewed. I think I said that on the last episode. The tables have <laughs> turned. Uh-oh. So, uh -oh. Yes. I'm in the hot seat. So, Courtney. Yes, darling. Courtney. <laughs> well, should, well, let's say let's explain just this one quick thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we do training at our brokerage. It's like an 11-week program, and that's largely based on mastery, meaning it can take longer if agents need more help with any particular aspect of the training or if we have to go deeper into a particular thing. And my style, just generally as a person, has like a tough love quality mm -hmm. to it. And so Silka and Nick were like, let's talk about that because it is probably a little bit different than at a lot of brokerages. I oh, for 100% it's different. Yeah. 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 Yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of uh, brokerages don't even offer their agents training yeah. <laughs> or one-on-one or -on -one training a lot of oh, yeah. brokerages don't offer training oh, yeah. period yeah not the kind of training we do yeah no. i mean a lot of brokerages don't offer the training especially not the training that we do but the one-on-one -on -one training that actually gets agents into a space of knowing what they're doing before they're mm -hmm. like thrown to the wolves which right. is what mm -hmm. so many people are so right. it's like an in-depth boot camp style mm -hmm. training session yeah led by me the queen herself. Herself. truly yeah <laughs> and i want to my first question is what made you decide to create this training in the first place? That's a really, really great question. So um, what happened was I had, when the brokerage was still quite small, I would do sort of one-on-one -on -one mentorship and training. And there was a moment where a competitor who shall not be named picked two of two people who worked with me that I had trained that were just starting to get productive and brought them to her team. And I thought, I felt like okay, you know, I can't, um, I, need, I need to be able to attract and retain people um, by creating from the beginning an element of expectation and trust that supports growth. Like I've always looked at it like artist management or development or something where it's like you come in kind of like you want to do something, but you don't know how to do it, but you come in usually from an employee position somewhere else. So you don't really understand the kind of thinking it takes to lead your own business, like agents are, have to be. You have to think of it like it's your own business. And then also the responsibility that goes along with that. So a lot of the training is mindset training at the beginning. But then you can see how people really perform. And I thought if I start a training class where say I get 10 agents in this class, then I can see who the best ones are and then invite those people to join the um, brokerage. So at the beginning, there was no expectation that the trainees would actually be Acme agents. It was kind mm -hmm. of, we even opened it up to some other brokerages and we had people in the training that were from other brokerages and it was paid. It was mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. But what made me feel that like that is that I wanted, I wanted a better crop of people to choose from and I wanted to be able to earn the trust of the people I was inviting in a way that would allow them to feel safe to stay and grow here at Acme. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. But now, now it's a little different. Now we get, I don't know, maybe 10 inquiries every couple of weeks, like maybe five a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, we have interviews and we make sure that people can digest at least the concept of the contract. So it's more deductive stuff. And before they even get into the training, we're already making sure that they have what it takes to potentially to that, succeed. Yes, to that end, that's my next question. What are the qualities that you're looking for in trainees? Oh my God, so this is good. <laughs> so I love it when a trainee has had another business or like has some work experience. So they are not like fresh out of the 
box and never have had a job before. Because if you go into real estate thinking it's going to be easy, I think you get really frustrated by all the stuff you actually have to learn to do the job. And those people tune out, they show up to class not prepared, they don't do the homework, it's a very laissez-faire, and I get frustrated, I'm like, I'm wasting my fucking breath right now, I am not going to show up here and teach this class unless people actually show up wanting to learn, period. I'm out, I'm not mm -hmm. gonna do it, it doesn't serve me. And it doesn't serve your purpose that you said you, you wanna be here for, you know? Um, so I'm looking for people who have intelligence, drive who actually want to be real estate agents like full-time or part-time doesn't so much matter to me as long as the desire to be an agent is strong and that means like yeah you don't just listen to the coaching or the training but you actually apply it you know we do whole sequences on instagram we do whole sequences on competition we do whole sequences on what's going on in the market and it's like if you don't actually aren't interested in architecture you're not interested in interest rates or what a lender has to say or knowing what probate is, this is the wrong job for you. Mm -hmm. So I love it when people raise their hand, you know, show up prepared, do the assignment. And the best quality is coachability. So I've had in the past where people have really like, they just can't take the coaching. In fact, just this session, we had somebody who, who, you know, seemed like they could potentially be a good candidate, but even in the interview process, it was very difficult for this person to even just take the coaching on the contract, um, from me. And I'm like, you have to be comfortable with a female in leadership who, you know, has a mouth and entitles herself to it, which is an uncomfortable space for certain people. It just is man or woman, it can be uncomfortable. That's true. But the thing people need to know, I, I think they need to understand, and if you know me, you know this, is that it comes from a space of trying to bring out the absolute best in every person. And it never comes from a space of judgment, ridicule, humiliation, or, or posturing or positioning. Like I, we just aren't a firm that gives out sales trophies, that puts one person ahead of another for any reason. I'm aware of the fact things can be ripped out from under you at any time. Like one time I had 80% of my business ripped out from under me in one phone call because the person I was working with found a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And literally it was a phone call that made me have to shift my entire mindset on how my business was supposed to look on diversifying uh, where my leads come from and on figuring out what our real value proposition was. So there are things that happen to you that give you some grit, you know, and those are the things I try to share from the beginning so people don't have to learn them on their own by making huge mistakes. Yeah, and people have to see it's a career and not a job. And people have to see, yeah, you're not going to get handed leads. You have to earn it. You're not going to get opportunities just because you showed up to class either. Like I've had trainees ask me, well, why can't I host your open house? And you've been in class for three weeks. I'm like, if I gave you a lead, I'm not sure you would know how to close it at this point. You haven't even been trained on how to do the buyer agency meeting or, or how, to, how to explain the process. Like if I asked you right now the difference between an appraiser and an assessor, do you know what that means? Mm -hmm. Like you have to know certain things to be able to serve the public properly. And I don't want to be on the end of some real estate lawsuit, you know, because one of our agents did something in the field that was just based on lack of education instead of an intention, you know, no yeah. accidental mistakes. Yeah. But that takes people who, who want to learn really and are coachable and understand that the training that we do is like, it's almost like a combination of immersive training and, and book training and academics, you yeah. know? I mean, and that's, that's Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No. <laughs> Jinx, I feel like so you're handing, polite. You I both owe me a Coke. I feel like you add, you're handing the people like the key to the kingdom. Yeah. The I training do. really is that. It's so true. Yeah. It's so true. And, you know, it, it all circles back to like what we've spoken about before about barriers to entry mm -hmm. and how they're so low. And so a lot of agents, it's like they do this course that has like very little applicability to what you actually do. You mean like the online training? <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. The, the licensing course. The licensing course has like low applicability to what you actually do in the day-to-day -day operations of being an agent. Right. You know, so like having, you know, having someone who's actually telling you and showing you, look, this is in practice what you're up against. It sets these agents miles ahead of mm -hmm. their competition who's out there just kind of figuring it out by ha experiencing it themselves right you know i like i always like to use the driving test versus actually driving right so when you, when you pass the written test and 
you set somebody on the four or five in rush hour, <laughs> they're going to have a real hard time. And you know what? And, and this real this estate the in LA is the rush four hour. or five in rush hour. It really yes. is. Yeah. And especially when the market shifts like this, you have to be able to have certain kinds of conversations with people. You have to really understand what you're doing. I mean, I can't express it enough. I've had many clients um, tell me about their previous experiences and how misled by or surprised by the experience they were. And I'm like, really? You went in with no, you know, physical inspection contingency and you weren't even in competition? Like what? Right. Mm-hmm. What did you know what that even meant for you? Mm-hmm. No, I tried to I tried to ask for credit because I found out that something something and then I couldn't do it. I'm like, wow. You know, and I don't wanna, you know, I, I just I think that buyers have the right to choose whatever options they want for their offer as long as they are aware of what the risks are. But you have to be able to explain and predict outcomes to help your clients really have a stress-free experience on what, you know, moving yeah, and all of these things yeah, are yeah. the traditionally mm-hmm. high stress experiences in people's lives. Yeah, as, as opposed to reacting on impact of whatever it is. Right. Yeah. I guess it's just a lot of agents who give our field a bad reputation. It's so true. I don't know if they always mean to, though. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the other sad thing. Yeah. 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 It's Sometimes, just not knowing. and Yeah, it's the not knowing. Mm-hmm. And people's feelings get hurt, too. You know? Like, it, this is not an emotional... It doesn't have to be emotional from the agent side. It shouldn't be. Sometimes people take on their clients' anxiety and stress so much... You're like, how do you even sleep at night? If you have five clients all giving you hell, you can't take it on emotionally. There's a healthy way of realizing the transactional part of this that's separate from you as an agent. Nick, you're sensitive like that. Sometimes you take on people's shit. I definitely take oh, on I take people's it on emotions. You take yeah, it on you too. Do. Yeah. That's, yeah. I we think are, that's part yeah. of a good agent's yeah. trait, though, is being empath. empath- an empath. An empath, yeah. <laughs> I think it can Empathetic be... Empathetic to other people's feelings and needs. I feel and like... And the desire to make them happy and please them and make everybody feel good. Because that is sort of... that, But that is part of it. I don't know if I it totally is, agree with that. I think mm, empathy is also... It goes a certain goes way. a filter too. Right. You know, so you can end up having more feelings about a certain type of thing than your clients actually do. So you have to remember, who am I fighting for now? Yeah. Like, why are we fighting about my access to the property six days before closing instead of five am i fighting Mm -hmm. with you or am i fighting with the seller Mm -hmm. you know like sometimes you have to give up that feeling of it's a war you know and you have to let rational thinking prevail and sometimes you also have to learn to manage your clients crazy expectations that's it yeah that's it. that's the part or their fear <laughs> right which sometimes i have a heart like their fear sometimes goes into me and then i feel that fear i'm like okay, whew, okay. yeah this is yeah so. but this circles back that's, to the importance the of thing. the training right it's like if you know the contract and you know what your rights are and what they are not then you can break it down to the client like look we're allowed access Right. Five days prior to close of escrow. Right. Six days prior, they can say no. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's just or the like value. informational ask, access. You know? Mm-hmm. you know, if it's the same as the physical, and then if we ask to go and get a window, uh, you know, bid, the sellers can say no. Hopefully, the agent doesn't, but they can contractually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so, uh, and that's just an example. And that's just so, yeah, an example. But- so, like for for example, in the training. You know, I don't think it makes great agents to be more concerned with having bodies. This is like a, to me, like the big brokerage thing is like, you need bodies. You got to report to corporate, you know, you've collect your desk fees. Yeah. Collect your desk fees. Mm -hmm. You're selling them title and an escrow and you need to have these, you need to do recruitment numbers and you don't even care about the quality of the people, but you know, you make more money on the people who are newly licensed and you make it look like it's so easy. We're going to do everything for you. This is not teaching people how to fish. This Mm -hmm. makes brokerage hoppers. Mm-hmm. And that is not what we are about. I don't think it get, it does any favors for the agent to to pat them on the back and say, good job, when actually what they're doing, like, for example, we do MLS description writing. If it's not good, it's not good. Right. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, and that's, that is, that way people handle that is what tells me if they're going to make it or not. And what, how people handle that tells me if I can throw them a lead or have them support me on a sale or something. Do they have the ability to handle it? 
Because if they're not getting that from me, if they can't take it from me, it sounds a lot worse when it comes from a client who's disappointed. And maybe that client doesn't tell you to your face, that client tells their friend who was gonna use you but decided not to, now they saw the disaster that happened. Like it's a, it, it has a domino effect. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, we've worked so hard to c protect the reputation of our firm. And I think we've done a great job of people coming to us by attraction. Like I don't recruit, I don't And call I love how you just led into this next question. Oh, is there a next question? <laughs> hey, what distinguishes an Acme agent from the others out there? Well, first of all, <laughs> it's a law of attraction. So mm -hmm. I think people see us and they see what we're doing and maybe they've seen me talk or they've met me in the field or something and they feel kind of like, oh, it's a breath of fresh air or somebody who's not bullshitting me about whatever. So I feel like that's a, something that attracts. I think they see the quality of our work and how we represent people and they know the quality of our listings because people walk in and they're like, I love what you do, you know, and I love it when they say that because it's really not for us. It's really for our clients. But I think if other people can see how beautiful the homes are and how well we present them, that it really is, shines a light on the clients. But we love our clients. Like, you know, we love making them shine. So you know, that is not a short-term strategy for sales. That's a long-term thing, something we're constantly auditing and, you know, whatever. So I think that the striving for excellence and the fact that we don't accept anything less than excellent is um, something that distinguishes us, uh, especially when it comes to newer agents and people who are in the training program. Like, I feel like they come out feeling way, way more ready to attack the industry. And I also tell them, don't try and sell while you're in training. It doesn't make sense because you won't know what to do with it. And I think that's something that a lot of brokerages probably don't do. But for me, it took like a year and a half or two years of being an assistant to feel confident enough, like I know what I'm talking about, that I could protect somebody. Otherwise, I had to pull somebody in, which is fine. That's how it should be. You, you mm -hmm. need a mentor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have that built into the program as well because I just don't think left to their own devices, people who walk in the door are ready to sell just because you got your license. For sure not. Did that sentence make sense? Uh, totally. Okay. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> it takes a little bit of time to get empowered to do this. It does take yeah. time, but it also takes training. It takes like repetitive uh, concepts. And that's another thing that like we do, you know, we make sure people understand what's a 9A report. Say it to me again. Say yeah. it again. Say it again. Yeah. Like, say it again. Now yeah. I'm going to ask you again. What is it again? You know? Yeah. Like, there's no shame in the memorization game, you know? Like, yeah. we make sure people <laughs> have the words they need to use to actually communicate the thing under pressure. Yeah. And your tough love training style definitely prepares people for the kind of, like, you know, the kind of experience they might have with someone who's drilling them with questions because they're a first time buyer and they have no idea what they're doing and they feel like they need everything answered then, you know, yeah. it's like, it, you know, if, if someone just presents you with a 9A report once and says, okay, this is a 9A report, this is what it is, you know, and chances are next time you see that thing, you're going to be like, what? Right. This thing again? Buyers wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what that was if I didn't know what it was. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't with, have any meaning to me. Right, but with the with the training style that I think you go through with uh, with our training, it's like, you know, people are really having it drilled into them what everything means and what the impact of those things are. So when they go out into real life and they're practicing this and they're communicating it to their client, it's like, hopefully the fear kicks in. Right. <laughs> and they're like, wait, yes. I can't, I can't, I can't fuck make Courtney this up. <laughs> I can't fuck this up. Don't let me down. <laughs> but Courtney it's on like the Courtney's shoulder. Courtney's always here. Yeah, yeah I'm right there. All right, again. <laughs> I have made people cry. I mean, I know that. And I know sometimes, I, I feel like sometimes, I mean, the honest truth of it is, I walk out of here sometimes pissed off. Like, I'm not accepting what's going down right now. This has to change. You know, it frustrates me very, very much when I feel like my breath is being wasted. Mm -hmm. Like, I hate that feeling. Do not come here thinking this is the only time of the whole week that you're going to spend on real estate and you're going to be a great agent. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sometimes I drop F-bombs. Drop, not drop. <laughs> you drop. drop them. I drop them. I do. <laughs> It happens. There are bombs. They drop. Or sometimes I'll say, like, what, you know, am, do you really want to be a realtor? Because if you do, you need to show up, you know? And that does maybe make some people think 
whether or not they really do want to be a realtor now that they know more about what it's about. Mm -hmm. But I think a great experience for people thinking to come to Acme and jump into this training is to go to a bigger brokerage and do a couple deals there. Mm -hmm. You know, experience that, see if that works for you. It, it works for a lot of people. Um, ours is more like a tech startup kind of vibe, you know, where we're all collaborative and we all are like on each other's side. Not a, no gossip, no, no drama, you know, it's just really like, okay, we're all like in a brainstorm, like we're, you know, we're trying to figure out the best way to do a thing, you know, and it feels like everybody on the team is somebody you would want to like hang out with um, and talk real estate or whatever with. I'm proud of our team for that because as we grow, it was hard. I was nervous that there would be a quality control issue, but in fact, I, I do love what, and I think it's part of the training makes you bond. Like people have formed alliances with the people they went through training with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's another huge part of building camaraderie and a culture. You know, people are here by choice, not because I paid them to be here, not because, um, we say, look, all you need to do is go out and sell. We'll handle everything else. But because they know that the skills that they're learning here, they can innovate from use as a platform to create new things and do other important change, you know, like changing mm -hmm. media or, you know, different flyer design or like whatever they can take the platform and make it their own. Um, I forgot my train of thought, but <laughs> they can do that. Yeah. Uh, but Good without, culture. without Good feeling culture. like, yeah, with yeah. culture, but without yeah. feeling like stymied, like it's not like, oh, you have to use this template or you have to do this. Mm. You can do your own thing. Like one of our agents, uh, hired a brand person to create like this amazing tissue paper and like her own logo. And, you know, she creates like pottery font. and her own stuff, but yeah. her own font, all the yeah. things. And I love that. And mm -hmm. it was so in line with the brand that I know the, the messaging is getting through to the people who are attracted to us. That's mm -hmm. what I wanted. That's what I wanted to say. Like it's a safe space to grow. I do, I do feel like big brokerages are for people who love that, Go into the office. There's a receptionist, fax machine, fax machine. Mm. Uh, they pop, still have those. Ear. I know. <laughs> I don't think anybody uses them, but um, but you know, like more of that like door closed, corporate, corporate vibe. kind of vibe. Yeah. yeah, pins maybe. I don't know. Well, you were seen here. Like this is not the space to sit on your hands, you know? right? Or just kind of drift, drift off into the abyss of a thousand other agents right. in right. that corporate And no one office. really cares about yeah. you. You're just a number. And, That's a really yeah. great thing to say to answer your question, it's like the agents that are here are agents who want to be seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. And, and we've lost agents who didn't really want to live up too, you know, because I've, yeah. I've had difficult conversations, you know, saying like, look, you know, I'm not going to just hand you my business. That's not how this works. You're not entitled to it. You know, I have to make a living too, you know, mm -hmm. but I do share opportunities. You know, I share a lot of opportunities and I've contributed to the growth of so many agents. And I believe that that is like a deeper legacy mission for me. It, it, like, you know, when eventually I do exit the business, I hope I leave behind like people who are grateful and accomplished. Yeah. And does this like, it could be perfect for my question. Oh, you're uh, leading into it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's like mind reading or something. I um, so. What makes you a good coach? I think that's and a leader. I mean, I don't know how to comment on myself. What do you think makes me a good coach? You're throwing it right back at me. I am. Well, I think you're a person that empowers other people. You Thank you. put the wind in the sail, and that is a, a good, great quality. You're, especially with females, like you want females to succeed. You have sort of that mission, right? Yeah. Like making I do. females empower themselves or learning how to help themselves or empower them, empower them. And like I said, you put the wind in the sails and that is like, it's an amazing quality and you're, you're not shy to share your wisdom. You give opportunities. You don't pop, you don't stop them from happening. You don't see competition in that way. You're Thank not, you. You're not threatened by competition. I'm not threatened by competition. You that is true. encourage it. I do. And, and, I think that makes you an amazing leader, in my opinion. I no. what did I miss? love that. <laughs> I love that. I can add on to that. I mean, I, I, I feel like, you know, whether it's women or men, you know, I mean, the men, the male side has to be receptive to the female leadership. Right. And we do have people who are, and we've had people who are not. Right. And it doesn't align. Right. But, you know, but I feel like regardless, you know, as Soka said, you empower people to 
like be their best selves. And in a way, it's kind of like, uh, you know, like a tough love mom who doesn't take your excuses or your shit and is going to say like, no, you're going to do this thing. And the accountability of that matters to pe- like matters for people's success, you know? Like, you can have a parent who doesn't give a shit where right. you end up or what they do. Or you can have someone who holds you to a higher level and who, like, expects you to exceed or at least meet those expectations. And I think that that quality is what also churns out solid agents, you know? It's the, it's the like, whole thing about teaching a man to fish, you know? It's yeah. like, mm-hmm. if you're just getting thrown leads here and there, you know, like, you're not building a sustainable business because you don't know how to fish yourself. Right. You have to know how to fish and then also keep and catch, or catch and keep the fish, Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Retention. <laughs> Retention, exactly. Yeah, retain the fish. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Not- how do you cook the fish? <laughs> how do you cook? How do you fillet? And yeah. want to eat the <laughs> fish and enjoy it. <laughs> well, well, you don't accept mediocrity. That is, yeah, it. and that is that is the most important thing yeah. because, and even even w- I mean, with everybody, even with the top producers, you like this is not right. Da 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 da. She calls it out. She calls out every single thing, and it's a hundred percent. You you also see everything. I do everything. It yeah, is, no, I mean, it's how true. you do that, but it's like there's nothing that slides under the radar, <laughs> like nothing. Well, I mean, I mean, the no, reality no. is I'm like, when I see, for example, I'll see like a Instagram uh, transcription that has an error in it. Like there was one Instagram transcription that had my name as police. I got so mad that that wasn't caught. And when I brought it up to our social media gal, I was like, how'd that happen? She's like, yeah, I saw that, but I didn't know how to fix it or something. And I was like, okay, okay, take it down. I do not want anybody thinking we missed that thing. Right. Because that's not acceptable. If it's not right, don't do it. Right. You know, if the house got painted and it doesn't look right, re-fucking paint it. Mm -hmm. Don't just throw, well, it was like, the business cards are printed upside down. Don't use them. I don't want people walking out of here with a business card that has the upside down printing thinking we think that's okay. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, the FedEx Kinko's printed the brochures wrong. Hide them. Email (laughs) a digital copy. Do not let somebody walk out of this open house with a messed up brochure. You know, I bet I think quality control is so important. I mean, that's actually something that's really missing from a lot of, Mm -hmm. of brokerages. I just, I just feel like, the people who belong at Acme are a different breed of agent and a different type of person who really want uh, to have a long-term home and a space that they feel is where they, where they are trying their hardest to meet their highest expectations of themselves. And if you, if you aren't open to that and you want to slide, it's just not the right place for you. It's just not. And I'm okay with that. You know, so I think people should go to other brokerages and like check it out and and experience that uh, bigger brokerage thing. And then, you know, do a couple of deals, see how that feels. And then if they're still interested and attracted by what it is Acme's doing, then then reach out, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm-hmm. Thank you for the questions. You're and very welcome. Thank you to anyone who's listening who who got that and can be inspired by that because you know, I think sometimes it's important to get into what why we're here and why we're doing this in the first place. And you know, I just really appreciate um, the people who love us and pay attention to us. So thank you. We'll see uh, you next time on Under All Is the Land. See ya. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Under All Is the Land, real, real real estate. Courtney, your friends, about to show you how to generate wealth. Get educated, do for yourself. Add a couple notches to your belt. Under All Is the Land. Under all is the land. The real, real, real under estate. all is the land. <laughs> we all went peace signs. We yeah. did. Full <laughs> <Right. laughs> Spice Girls. <laughs> <laughs>